You know, I, th- I think before we start this, a little congratulations should be in order for Lucka Bach, baby. You already know. On to the semifinal. Let's get into it. Here comes Danny Tuzizawa. Back to Baker. Baker with the fin. Kurt Baker in for DC. And this may well do it. Old glory with the dry. The New Zealand Sevens legend, Kurt Baker, with the cherry on top. Can you believe it? Welcome back to the On the Line Rugby Podcast, a show brought to you by the Bleed Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Nagi Ishii, and welcome back. You know, it was a lot of big weekends. Uh, definitely something I probably would have been missing from watching in my own free time uh, if South Africa lost. But, you know, back the boys, we got back. Uh, a little definitely sad for Ireland and Fiji. We'll get into that a little bit. And definitely for Japan. But, you know, things happen. It's World Cup cycle. I think this is probably some of the best World Cup games and rugby and just in general I've seen in a – probably since I started watching the game, really. And I'm really excited for the finals. Um, and I definitely think that the semis will be interesting. Could be on upset alert, but we'll get into some of those narratives here. Uh, I definitely think to start off that Ireland was robbed of a semifinal appearance versus Argentina just because of uh, – I'm not sure what was going on. I think this goes into the, the broader narrative of officiating over the last – weekend um but whether you know you're a normal detractor of the officiating in rugby or not um i definitely think that there is a couple laws that were missed as a whole looking holistically at the games both for ireland and new zealand um you could definitely say france and south africa had a couple debacles in there as well but you know everything from missing blatant hands in the rucks interfering with a player while rolling away, um, you know, kicking and kicking the ball to your side of the mall, or I mean, inside of the breakdown, uh, among other things, it, it just wasn't the uh, most, I would say, flawless brand of footy or of a called game I've seen. I definitely thought that a couple of the cards uh, in the South Africa standpoint probably should have been let it go. Uh, and for in the Ireland standpoint, uh, a little bit more enforcement on that breakdown section that surprisingly for two of arguably some of the best referees in the world, Rain Barnes and uh, Ben O'Keefe kind of left up to basically the imagination. And, you know, I, I'm definitely not for, you know, just letting the boys play. You'll obviously have mistakes here and there, but uh, I definitely believe that if needed, uh, while you should not be in charge of dictating the flow of the game or the outcome of the game, um, I definitely think these small things need to be done just because, you know, with different people playing from around the world, you know, for example, in Super Rugby, you have different law innovations that kind of allow a lot more, uh, shall we say, niggly kind of play kind of chippy more uh basically if if, you know don't get caught but kind of rules whereas the north is obviously a little bit more structured in that style uh i feel like if those things kind of went in other directions in, in both games you know you obviously could see that the game going in different directions um hopefully in that sense uh an irish win um, either way, regardless, and if Ireland or New Zealand advanced, uh, it, it would be a tough run for Argentina to really step into that mold and take their place. But uh, it, it, you know, it probably would have been the easiest path to the finals, you could argue. But hey, you know, it, it's I, I, the game's got to be called the game's the way. Got the basically, you just got to call it the way it should have been, and. If uh, if you're going to leave things up to the imagination and a lot of people have seen it, uh, I definitely think that, you know, maybe more training, maybe the shortage of refs should be um, addressed. Uh, that's another one of the big topics I think we've gleaned from this weekend is that just between the pressure that refs have and um, the amount of real full-time refs there are, obviously, you know, for 
a lot of us, whether we play for club in, you know, an amateur setting, academies, pro, uh, international test matches, you know, most of the time, in fact, 90% of the time, rugby is not your main job. It is obviously a side gig, you know, like for example, with Ben O'Keefe, I believe he's a lawyer, uh, you know, among other things as a ref, you know, there, there needs to be more, I think not only does this go to payment and reputation for the players, but also for the refs and officiating staff as well, just because of, uh, you know, you're a part of the outcomes of the game. And obviously there has been a lot of shortages because of the pressures from fans, from teams, from being on the field to, you know, influence the cost. And I can say for one, uh, it, it would be a little too much for me to personally do it. Uh, I do have a level one certification for youth in high school. And uh, I kind of stopped doing it after college just because it just became a little too much to kind of have that almost burden on your shoulders to make sure that the game is properly done right. And, you know, knowing you may have missed something or called something wrong that could affect the game, uh, that kind of mental pressure affects everyone. And, yeah, that's probably contributing to a lot of the reasons why a lot of the refs are – a lot of – most refs aren't coming out. You know, maybe some of them, like me, they wanted to be – TMOs, but obviously as a TMO, you still have to be a primary ref for the next amount of time, you know, obviously build up your credentials and then move into that spot. But, you know, a lot of people just skip the spot so, and the opportunity just because it's uh, not worth it to them. Um, but that needs to be addressed. You know, obviously anything full time needs to be done with better pay uh, and better benefits. And I think World Rugby could use some time to look into that or if not year round training even for the test referees you know there's tons of older referees in the provincial and club level that could be elevated but just because of the amount of time it takes to elevate those uh officials up to the standard of say a wayne barnes and angus gardner etc it, it they're not going to get as much mileage out of it so they shoot it down um those of you referees who watch this podcast know you know um so maybe some better things on that end, the little nuances of the game that a lot of people don't look at uh, need to be fixed in terms of getting more accountability on the field and uh, more higher standards in terms of the play. You know, fans are always going to call out refs, whether it's right or wrong, um, just for the fact that they're the ref. But, uh, you know, obviously a little bit more covering your bases, a little bit more support on that end probably would do them a lot of good. Um, as we've seen in the, I believe it was the Wales and Fiji match, you know, hey, Yako Paper gets a blown calf, and next thing you know, the touchdown comes out and arguably refs the, probably the best game of rugby I've seen next to the Angus Gardner uh, 2019 South Africa New Zealand game. Uh, I, I definitely think that guy deserves more minutes. Definitely, I think he deserves to have his own space in the center stage. Uh, there also was an Australian ref. Uh, sh she was refing Super Rugby for a little bit. Uh, she was, I think, one of the better refs, and she did not get a, at least that I've seen, and did not get a World Cup bid. But, you know, alas, that is uh, another issue that I think we've gleaned from this weekend. You know, I think a crew means a big deal of difference uh, in terms of that department. I mean, despite the fact that the game should have been called a little bit better, at least, for example, to pivot towards the... Uh, France South Africa game, you know, Ben O'Keefe was not having, in my opinion, a, a very good game that he normally has. And uh, for an all New Zealand crew, including the card man himself, Brennan Pickerel, to be in the TMO booth, I figured he would be slotting in more to kind of adjust the flow. Perhaps it's more of a world rugby thing to keep the game flowing. And, you know, unless it's really blatant, just cut it. But, you know, I don't know. Perhaps it could go both ways. But that's definitely another thing. Uh, I think another thing that I looked at this weekend that was huge was Anton Dupont. I mean, it's sad for him, uh, but he fought a very good game. Same like the Irish, you know. As a side note, props to Johnny Sexton, props to Peter Ma O'Mahony, Tog Furlong, all those boys. It'll probably be their last World Cup. Um, well, at least in terms of Johnny Sexton, it is. And uh, it's sad to know that those legends will never sniff the World Cup final or even a semi, but they have had good careers. They're definitely first uh, rounders in my book, just like Anton Dupont, if he keeps it up. You know, to come back, what, 23 days, I believe it was, from that injury, and uh, suppose he had an operation that I did not know he had, and he's, his face looked 
like it, nothing happened. I didn't see a scar. I didn't see visible sensitivity. And he got knocked around a lot, despite with that scrum cap around. Um, uh, it was very impressive. He, you know, he enforced himself in all facets as if he was healthy. And I'm glad to see him do that. Um, you know, give it all for his team. I think being on the field meant a lot to the boys, given the fact that, you know, all the injuries and problems that they had and they put up a good fight. Um, I really expected him actually to wear one of those, like those NBA uh, half face guards mask kind of deal. And uh, surprisingly he didn't. So, hey, props to him and props to France, you know, as the host nation, you know, they did really well, but got to bite the bullet where you got to bite the bullet. South Africa came in to play. Um, as for the other quarterfinal exit that I was really sad about, uh, Fiji definitely is on the right track in terms of where they want to be, but I definitely think they need to, uh, fix a lot of the discipline issues and a little bit of a mechanical thing to get out of their own way. You know, unlike Australia, who has a lot of work to be done in all facets, whether it's blooding new players, uh, fixing the culture, uh, you know, obviously the penalties is a big deal and definitely the open play. But Fiji is there. I mean, they've proven it on all facets that they can be that semifinal team. And I could argue that they should have been in the semifinals. Uh, but it is what it is. You know, they. I'm, I'm definitely very hurt by their exit. Um, they're one of my favorite teams in the world. You know, I think they're a lot of people's uh, second or third favorite team for obvious reasons. But... It, I think it's just the contrast into where they are. I think despite losing your head coach to the blues, uh, they've put up and shut up, you know, they've blooded young players. They've gotten a lot of mileage out of the overseas rule and especially out of the draw, you know, their surprising performance this year, uh, not surprising to me, but surprising to most, uh, has definitely fueled this advance and will continue to do so moving forward. I hope to see them in the semifinals next year. I believe they have it. In them, they just need to get a couple things down, and they'll be fine. Um, obviously, they're a little top-heavy with older legends. I'm sure they'll be phased out as more years go on. There's a lot of new blood around the world and from Fijian talent, and a lot of guys they can actually poach. You know, you got a Hassan Satutu who may be bolting from New Zealand, among other players, and a lot of definitely a lot of players overseas, especially here in the U.S. that I know of Fijian heritage that can ball out at a high level. Um, they're ready, and I hope they they can go. Uh, as for Japan, another team that uh, I do support, uh, it was a little sad that they had to lose to Argentina. You know, they had moments, but I just don't think they were the same team from 2019. You know, I don't know whether it was Jamie Joseph's departure that he just kind of just took his foot off the gas or whatever it may be, but Japan just didn't look with that same vigor, that same fury that I thought that they would come into the World Cup with. You know, obviously that team flows, as I've said before, through Kazuki Himano's form, through Ryoto Nakamura and Ryohei Yamanaka and Kotaro Matsushima. And, you know, all of them would have off games in the pools and the pre-stage matches. And some of them were great. You know, it, it all just didn't flow together. You know, I think they used a lot more foreign influence than I thought. Uh, and they do need to go back to leaning more on that, you know, Nippon heritage that they have, that hardworking ethic that they bring to the table and that work rate and i think with eddie jones coming to the table um come on guys i, I think it's undeniable at this rate you know eddie jones probably will actually nah, he will uh resign from the wallabies and go to japan unblamingly so for all of you super rugby pundits out there it is not okay look it is not his fault i guess in, in a way He's building for the culture. A lot of people on YouTube that I watch had tended to cite that he kind of helped uh, create and maintain with not a lot of difficulty the very uh, mm, miscreant, I guess, delinquent mentality that Australia has had over the last years from – you know, the Michael Cheka years to kind of Dave Rennie when it kind of blown out of proportions with Darcy Swain and et cetera. Uh, you know, articles out there, need I say less, but they, uh, there's a lot more problems in Australia than just the Wallabies. Um, Rugby Australia in general is facing the death of their program. And I'm sure everything from the top down is just as messed up. 
Uh, if you look at Eddie Jones, you know, he really just wanted to blood the new players for the future. And I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, they were never going to be in a place, I think, to really get out of the quarterfinals, despite what most people may have thought. I thought they would have had a quarterfinal exit. I thought that was the ceiling that they had. But, you know, such as it is, uh, they didn't show up to play. A lot of players look broken. I think a lot of uh, criticism has been dealt on that, that I r really don't have to gloss over again but um i think it was the right thing to do i think they know that the process is there and for him to leave well a lot of people would say is a, it's a slap in the face and you know it kind of is but obviously why would you want to be in the most negative media market where the league is arguably dying you have to actual league you know the nrl and to the afl and cricket and you know you Players are not gravitating towards that. You know, you're not getting the same quality of players from the provincial level. Everything down the line is just being taken down around you. I, I, I don't blame him for leaving. Uh, this is way more stressful than I probably would have thought uh, from his England journey coming over. You know, I thought his homecoming would have been a lot better uh, received. But, you know, such is life. Australia is going to be Australia. And uh, I think it's time to welcome Eddie back to Japan. I'm sure he'll turn it around again put them back on the right track again and get them into that quarterfinal, hopefully semifinal in the next World Cup contention. Please, please bring back the Blade Blossoms. They are not tier two. They are tier one. And by the way, they are going to crush the, uh, well, what is it going to be? Probably Five Nations Cup when they come out with it. I, 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 I'm sure it'll be in a couple years, but I know it's been in the talks that, for all of you who don't know, uh, it's going to be the rugby championship is going to be elevated to have hopefully Samoa and Tonga. They're gonna already got bids from Fiji and from Japan. They're looking to get bids from Georgia as well. I think that is a great thing for uh, world rugby, obviously, to elevate you know test players more to the game of other players around. Obviously, to combat the Six Nations, and you know, since Japan and the uh, Georgia were slated to actually join the Six Nations and got banned. Oh, not really banned, but uh, DQ'd out of that consideration. I would love for them to go to the Southern Hemisphere comps, which are actually in similar time zones, and fight the good fight and show that Southern Hemisphere rugby is here to stay and they belong on that Tier 1 stage. Japan definitely does. Georgia, I would say, is, on, is flirting with it. I think that they should be there. Obviously, you know, their scrum is elite, but need I say less? Um, but yeah, those are some of the big things I gleaned from this weekend. Uh, as for the semi on look, you know, I've said it once and I'll say it again. All Blacks have definitely have the easiest path to a final of any team. Well, that whole pool stage, I probably would say, would have the easiest path to the final. Uh, regardless of who entered from the Ireland and New Zealand side, I definitely think that Japan would have put up a bitter fight versus both teams to get there. I think probably Ireland would have blown them out. New Zealand probably would have kept it close. Hopefully Japan would have won in that stage. But that's just me pandering to my own uh, head cannon. But uh, Argentina obviously is no slouch. You know, they've beaten the All Blacks many a time. But uh, I, I don't believe that they have the juice to really push it further than maybe a five-point loss, bonus point loss. A, they deserve it. They uh, they've pushed that, you know, that they belong on the world stage at a high level, and you know they're gonna have to obviously, you know, celebrate the commendation and the advancement. But they're in for a rough road, especially if the All Blacks are gonna bring out who I think they're gonna bring out at nine and ten. I hope it's Cam Roygard. I hope it's Damian McKenzie. I am tired of Richie Mwanga, and I'm tired of watching Aaron Smith. Uh, we all know who the future is. Roll them out. You know this is. I'm not going to say a tune-up game for them as a not-so-all-black fan, but we all know they have the better team on the paper, on the pitch. As long as they put it together, should be pretty, you know, cross T's and not your eyes, basically. Um, but, they, yeah, they Argentina and the Pumas have a long road. Uh, as for England, they will probably get smashed by South Africa, I hope. So I... You know, a lot of people were saying that, oh, uh, South Africa doesn't deserve to be there. And despite just being a box supporter, and I know that kind of can cloud judgments here and there, but uh, 
you know, I think if you look at it objectively outside of their 10, they really have no problems. They were just as good in the forward pack as they have ever been, despite their injuries in uh, set pieces, nothing to be understated with them. Their back lines, I think have been elevated beyond what they were in 2019 with, you know, Kane Moody with Kurtley Arnso with the inclusion of Andre Esther Hazen and uh, Kobus Reinock is playing out of his mind right now to the point where Faf the clerk is being on the bench. All they have to do is fix Monty LeBlanc's kicking, man. That's all they have to do in their back. England, on the other hand, is still, you know, trying to right the ship. I'm not even sure if Steve Borthwick deserved the job in, in any fashion. You know, I'm not saying he's not a great coach. You know, watching his Leicester team blow out most of the teams in the premiership, including my sales sharks, has proven that he's a good coach. But uh, in the na- international level over the, since Eddie's left, I, I haven't seen – what I thought I would see from that. Oh, he's the dramatic changer for England. And it's not, it's in more turmoil than ever. And you could argue that Wales was in a worse spot when Gatlin came in and Gatlin obviously turned it around back to his old roots in a much faster fashion. Uh, I think that just shows to the quality of coaching and the support that he has. But that obviously says a lot about England. Um, I think they'll fight well. I think that it'll be a, hopefully, you know, depending on who, who they roll out in their lineup, as long as they don't do anything stupid like how they did with Marcus Smith at 15. I think they'll at least maybe keep it within 10 points, uh, if not to try to do anything, you know, out of the ordinary, I guess uh, I would say. South Africa's probably going to steamroll them, um, and it'll probably be a rematch of the 1995 World Cup final, which I will be l- just chomping at the bit to watch you know um obviously we've had a lot of tragedies in the south african space from a lot of the 1995 players you know passing away i guess would be a nice way of putting it for some uh and falling out of the spotlight so having them all brought back to the world stage you know supporting even the narratives of the probably the guy that brought a lot of rugby to our lives in Jonah Lomu, you know, the guy who brought rugby video games to, to life <laughs> as well. Uh, you know, almost bring them out, showcase the narrative, you know, everyone celebrates. I have a good match. It'll probably be a match for the ages. If I think it'll turn out the way it'll turn out. And that final will be probably one of the best, if not the best final I've ever watched in reruns or through my 2019s even against england it'll be fun um in terms of other news obviously you have uh some stuff domestically over here in the united states i think the mlr is taking a lot of big steps to um kind of copy the nba the mls and the wnba in terms of when they hire um or bring in new players they're gonna um, put them in ownership stake and stock in local businesses to kind of keep them, you know, ingrained in the franchise and keep them almost to bring more players like them over to America to grow the game. Um, I've said it once, I'll say it, I'll say it again. You know, the USA team is a tier three nation. It should be tier four in my personal opinion that, which doesn't even exist, but it should be there. They are terrible. They have no identity. Scott Lawrence is out in his own world. Uh, and, unless you can get a concrete identity, not only from the grassroots and on up, you're not going to really have a great path towards international greatness. Like you think no matter who you put out on the pitch. And I think a lot of teams in this world cup have shown that, but for example, uh, my hounds have definitely taken an influx of players from Ireland and from just Europe in general. You know, they just brought it over uh Ledster wing, Dave Kearney, you know, I'm surprised. I watch a lot of Ireland games. I know Rob Kearney. I did not know, uh, his brother played, let alone was pretty good. Watching his highlights, Dave is an exceptional player. Uh, a lot of them were a little old in the last 10 years, but um, I think what Dave can bring uh, as a co-owner, I guess, and they haven't really discussed what his stake is in, uh, in the Hounds program, but he brings in a lot of IQ, obviously, you know, from his Leinster and Ireland days uh, of just – being around the ball his he's effective at the high ball thing that's one thing that um, came out to me on film and his ability to kind of play the sideline to his advantage i think will help guys like julian dominguez will help guys like uh their new draft they mm-hmm. 
you, you can't go around that. You know, you have to use the sideline as your friend, and he, he is one for that. He definitely has another thing that I think they desperately need is that internal cutback, and his step for that internal cutback is very nice. Um, he'll bring in a lot of that definitely into the Hounds culture. I do not foresee him being a starting uh, stalwart, I guess, at the spot. Um, I definitely think Dylan Denenberg will put himself forward. Obviously, Julian Dominguez is there. They have a lot of big boys on that, uh, and big brands, definitely on that back three that I think will usurp him. I think he's more brought in as a player coach and as a way to hopefully grow the game domestically with added funds for the Hounds to do so from the academy system on up. But as for their forward pack, they just added uh, – this is probably the best signing I've seen them do this offseason – is adding the Georgian prop fresh off the World Cup – Pardon if I butcher the name, Zarabi Zvana from Georgia. He's 29 years old. He comes from Georgia. He's played in the Pro Duh. He's played in the top 14. Man, I've never heard of this guy, but this guy is an absolute freak of nature. In his thighs is probably the width of my body, if not more. He brings in the power of more than the U.S. power grid. Uh, when it comes to rushing with the ball, he keeps his legs churning. His fans are Derrick Henry-esque. I've never seen people fly more off his hands in rugby than that. Uh, obviously, the, again, another person to put uh, Julian Dominguez in on notice in that department. But he has a uh, – a lot of his older highlights were from the last five years uh, or two years ago. But, man, I, I would say even from the last two years ago, Zavana brings in that kind of like quick burst of just boomfa I have ever seen. He can catch a ball for from a standstill and then flow like a back into his second gear, break the line, and have no one catch him. He's not even, I would say, like a speedster at prop. I, I've just never seen it that quick. He, he's Angus Bell level. If Angus Bell had short speed to come to basically top off that his long speed, because his second gear and transition into it is quick. And if you do not catch him, he is gone. His I, he even has offloading. Like <laughs> I saw enough Sunny Bills in the highlight reel to probably make a whole 10-minute compilation. It, it, it is beautiful the way he can pass the ball from either end and pivot. Like He just knows where his guy is, and it's going to happen. I think he's going to be big for the scrum. Obviously, Georgian's scrum, is, I've said it once, I'll say it again, is probably, what, second or third best in the world? It definitely is in South Africa, but it's up there. Um, he'll definitely bring a lot to the table, obviously in terms of experience and because he has a lot more tread left on the tires, you know, uh, 29 years old to bring to the MLR and stick around for at least, you know, hopefully the next five to six years. Um, I think he's going to be big for the development of George Thornton, you know, obviously having Patty Ryan there has been immense for his development, but man, this guy can teach him so much and the rest of the four pack as well. And I can't wait to see what he brings to the table. The MLR is going to be big this year. I hope, you know, despite scandals aside, I, I definitely think that uh, they're in good hands, at least team-wise moving forward. If they, for example, with the Hounds, Toronto, and all these other wayward lost franchises can come back into the fray and give them an American fan base what they want, which is hardcore rugby. It doesn't have to be, you know what super rugby is, but just get it close, grow the game, advance it. Everyone will be happy. USA fans will be. And I certainly will, uh, in my journey throughout this for coverage and definitely for coaching. So, um, that's going to be it for me this week, guys. Thank you so much for joining me and definitely see you guys Friday, hopefully for some more previews, uh, lineup breakdowns and hey, hope for some more news. Let's see what happens. See you guys later.